Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. Uh, very interesting times uh, for all of us right now. Um, we have a uh, very special guest this morning, Greg Twiggs of uh, Golf Insurance Solutions. It's a division of the George Peterson Insurance Agency. Greg Twiggs had a, uh, has had a very interesting career. He was actually a tour pro for 20 years. Uh, accolades include winning the, the Farmers Insurance Open in San Diego, previously known as the Andy Williams uh, uh, I forget the rest of the name of it, but uh, it was the Farmers Insurance Open in 1989. And uh, for the last 12 years, he's been doing insurance, uh, particularly insuring uh, various entities in the golf business. So we thought it uh, was perfect timing to have him on this morning to talk about what uh, coronavirus is doing from an insurance standpoint in our business and just uh, insurance in the golf business uh, as a whole. Mr. Twiggs, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series. Thanks, John. Uh, hope everybody's healthy and well and not, uh, you know, getting frustrated enough to uh, harm themselves or others yet like I am, but uh, I'm glad to be a part of the PGA section here in Southern California and uh, with you guys today. So uh, feel free to send any questions over while we're going through this. It's pretty general and broad, but I think it'll be informative to everybody. Uh, so to get you started, I don't want to take up too much of your time today. Um, I'm the owner, partner, principal of Golf Insurance Services, and we insure over 125 golf properties. Uh, we do it a little different because I come at it from a, a person that loves the game. So I'm a little more hands-on and involved and have relationships that uh, – with some of you and Tom Addis, it spanned 45 years. So uh, it's a pleasure to sort of fill you in on what we're facing here with California fires. But I'm going to hit on the three biggest issues right now in the golf industry. And like I said, feel free to send over any questions you might have. Um, so on this next slide, I wanted to show you is I think you guys have, I don't know if your properties have experienced anything, but uh, how have California wildfires affected golf? Um, you know, we, we have a lot of courses that you wouldn't expect 10 years ago that now have become very high risk in the insurance world. And to give you an example, between 1999 and probably 2016, the property, to insure property, the rate was anywhere from two cents per thousand dollars of value out of a property to 10 cents per thousand. Right now we're looking at rates anywhere from 30 cents to thousand dollars of property up to if you're in a high wildfire it could be as high as two dollars per thousand. And 90 percent of this has been created by catastrophes all over the all over the world. Uh, property rates um, are affected by fires in California. California was the, probably the least punished compared to coastal states and anything else as it pertained to golf. Now, 
California is being is being viewed very critically because the Northern Cal fires created almost three and a half billion dollars in property loss. Golf courses, of course, are a great barrier because of the sprinklers, but uh, we've lost seven golf clubs to California fires in, in between maintenance and clubhouses in the last three to four years, and it's now come to haunt the pricing of insurance, which is more than doubled um, due to this property problem. Um, so they have brush scores. I gave you an example of what in one year the state of California looks like as in wildfire risk. This is a map that when you go from orange to red, um, it's pretty scary. So second thing we hit on on this is what are your options? You know, your owners, your, you know, this is affecting your raise, your, your, any kind of profit sharing, any kind of promotional uh, incentives that the, the owners of these clubs or cities or anybody would, would probably be giving you is because the options are shrinking. So in 2015, we had 12 carriers that provided insurance to golf courses under a very specialized program. Now, nationwide, we're down to maybe five carriers. And out of those five, at any one time, you can have, you could be down to one single carrier that's motivated. So your options for insurance have diminished greatly. Um, as a result, uh, they don't like me anyway. I mean, insurance is not a popular topic at any lunch, dinner, or otherwise, because they always feel like we're insuring everything that doesn't get paid for. Um, in the case of these wildfires, you, you could be left uh, going to what they call a secondary market or surplus. So one of the clubs in San Diego went from $40,000 to $179,000 because they're in the middle of a wildfire zone. So options have decreased dramatically and that all the operators, all the people you work for are facing those big changes. Um, will we see premiums return? Uh, my estimation is what we're seeing today will most likely be the new normal uh, with 30, 40, 50% increases, sometimes 100% increases from what they paid just in 2019. Because the insurance world has been waiting from that eight cent rate for years for the property rates to match what the value we're insuring. So I think new, mar new carriers will come into the marketplace, but the discounts won't be like what we had prior. So uh, hopefully, you know, California can uh, have a couple years without fires and think the horizon will be a little better, but I don't think much dramatic change from what we're seeing right now. So on to the next cheer me up bouquet that involves insurance when it comes to the golf business. Oh, wrong, wrong direction. So I don't know how many of your clubs have experienced a hack, a cyber disruption, uh, you know, viruses, all kinds of things. But, you know, you have a credit card machine or terminal at your club they're responsible for that transaction, but your servers are 
normally connected to either an active coax line through your provider and um, mostly online with a telephone connection as well if it goes most telephone services now go through your server um, give you some horror stories uh, Ironwood Country Club got hacked to get out of the hack it'll probably cost them 250,000 and they don't even transact cash money it's all information that was hacked and they were held under a what they call a crypto ransom to where it's very hard to trace um telephone got hacked through the server they had seventeen thousand dollars and seven minutes of telephone charges that were billed against the club public golf course so why do we need cyber insurance if you have a good IT guy well it sort of goes hand in hand uh, what we see in IT if they're really proactive and have given you a good system to work under they might catch uh, a virus before it gets implanted into your system but I'll give you an example how it's how it happens is they send an email you look suspicious and you delete it you've done everything right but the problem is that email has a tracer in it. So when they send the email the next time, and they'll bombard you with, with different kinds of scenarios, even familiar web, recognizable web search that you did recently that you're waiting on a reply. I mean, they're in your computer anyway. Well, when you open up that second email, there's a ticking time bomb going on and behind the scenes in your server that is releasing the virus and setting up could be ransom could be all kinds of repeating uh damage to your server and they they basically shut you down eventually with the virus so is an it company they're good for fixing your mistakes, but they might not be good for fixing a cyber, true cyber attack. Uh, I know some of the cities, you know, they do a lot of leases, but if it's an online city, there's a real scare. I don't know if you remember Baltimore had to do everything by hand because they had a, a ransom on the entire city operations. So what does cyber cover? Uh, cyber covers your cost of eradicating the hack. It'll cover your legal costs of sending out letters to people that might have been hacked or credit card numbers that could have been hacked. If, if they get passed, you know, you, with a terminal, you have a service provider. They have insurance and they have ways to protect you. But if it gets past that, Normally in a public golf course or semi-private, you'll have the two terminals separate. They don't go through your server. That's very recommended. But if it does go through and they get to personal information or company information, uh, the guys will restore that. They'll pay for any damages to your hardware. So it's a very valuable uh, insurance to have because the cost can go on forever and how does cyber apply to the golf industry well we've got tea time systems we've got information being input we need to save that information for marketing purposes you think you're the only one that wants that um, there's lots of people out there that you wouldn't believe from what they tell us that they're searching your computer all the time 
for ways to get on first hand information versus like you're not going to they're not going to get into chase or or wells fargo because that's an online privacy but anything that you save or store information that you keep for marketing purposes it might have emails telephone numbers possibly even credit card deposits they're going to have access to so the golf industry is the wealthy people that play golf, that's who they're after. And the last bullet point here is, is your club really gonna be hit by a, you know, is Miles Park or Rancho Park or, uh, you know, Encino gonna be hit by a cryptocurrency? Uh, if they can get to the cities, they might go through them to, to do it and, and the operators there to get access to, you know, IP addresses that they can hack. But in most cases, uh, they're going to target the private clubs. And if you don't have a cyber insurance policy now, uh, these crypto ransoms, for every time you don't pay, they just go up and they they extend, they keep putting those bugs into your IP address. So can you imagine if you were a country club and had to rebuild your website, de develop a new IP address? I mean, we're at, we're at 40,000 without paying a ransom, just in destruction of what you currently have. So, you know, they they get in, they tell you you have to pay them by Bitcoin or cryptocurrency because it's not traceable, and they just hang on forever. So um, I'd just be, you know, your telephone, Wi-Fi, everything has is not 100% safe. So I'd be really careful what information uh, is stored on a on-site server and how often you're communicating with uh, your IT people because they can put stops in place quickly if you even recognize them. So it's an education that uh, is the insurance world provides the relief, but the IT world is constantly i mean you've probably heard the sales pitch firewalls and different things that they want to change in your system and you say well you know we really don't have the money for that well please consider uh, looking into it because it's it's an invaluable tool and the southern cal pga could be next. How much of their information do you have, do they have of yours? Just a thought. So, going the wrong way. And our last topic of the day is this uh, dreaded coronavirus, COVID nineteen. Uh, you know. If you just picture, I've had 125 phone calls asking me, what's the insurance for this virus? And, you know, my, one of my proponents with the PG of America has always been, you know, how can I train these great golf pros that, have, that know every caveat of, the you know the ins and outs of the golf business there are greatest representatives to be the leaders in the industry i mean we we as golfers that dreamed of playing the tour and work in the industry you know we walk exact yardages we pay attention to our members and you know now if you want to make any money outside of teaching, 
you know, are you, do you have the tools to go into management or upper management or own a golf course? You know, what, what do you know about the industry? Well, you guys know the most about it. And uh, you would not believe out of all these clients, you know, what the percentage of them that read their policy that would have ever known the answer to that first question is less than 1%. Um, the insurance for loss of income or business interruption due to a virus like this, first of all, it's not covered by excluding bacteria, virus, and fungus. On every policy in the United States of America, there's that exclusion. And what's ironic is, is that exclusion for bacteria, virus, or fungus is related to you creating a unknown bacteria, mold, uh, viruses from food, salmonella, poisonings, fungus. It was never intended to be a national crisis that would that exclusion would pertain to. So when they say, I'm going to lose a million dollars this month because Gavin Newsom told me to close, there's no civil authority that reaches beyond because business income is a property insurance. It's a property bound commitment to pay you for a loss or a shutdown that relates to a peril on the policy. A peril is an event. So we have fire, wind, nuclear attacks, planes falling out of the sky, but not for viruses or, you know, some policies have terrorism. We could call this terrorism. The Chinese terrorized us with this virus. Well, now that exclusion on the policy eliminates that chance of that happening. Now, the federal government could give the hospitality industry a bailout. Um, but do you think they're really going to think about us people that are out playing golf in the sunshine first? Probably not. So uh, when you think of this effect it's had on you, workers comp, somebody comes to you and says, I feel sick. The workers comp, is going to have a hard time. They've they've agreed to accept the claims, but under workers' comp, the only viral infection medical payment is maxed out at ten thousand dollars. How are they going to prove you contracted the disease at Miles Square? I don't know. I don't know how they're going to be able to do that. So they're delaying payment, but they're accepting the claim. State of California, as we all know, will probably find a way to include that. But I can tell you in the other states, uh, they get a, they're not even venturing into talking about it yet. They're very worried about California, though, because it's so litigious. litigious and so loose with their guidelines that, you know, you could have five employees that say they got infected by somebody that was coughing at work that went out sick. Next thing you know, they test positive for COVID. They're on claim for two weeks, getting better. The only good part is we'll have to pay them, but the good part is we want them to get better and come back to work. So uh, what coverages are going to change? Um, the insurance world is not in a hurry to get into protecting pandemics. 
um, research labs, food processing, uh, you know, chemical companies, they have this kind of coverage because, and they pay for it dearly. But the last thing we want to do as a golf course is to be forced to buy a policy that would include this kind of coverage because it, it would, what we're already seeing would destroy the affordability for a club to be insured for what they're really concerned about, which is fire or major storms, wind damage, things that we we actually need the coverage for. And the last uh, highlight here is what options we have in filing a claim that could result in federal action to replace loss of business. So go back to your clubs, look really smart and go, whether we get any money or not, we we need to file a claim. So our, our company is gonna file claims for all of our courses. They've all been affected because if there is any federal monies to be had, we need to prove that we have at least attempted to collect money from our insurance company, that we've gone through the steps to identify just how much business has been lost. Um, as, I, as you guys, and especially California, uh, I have clubs all over the country, and I have a, clubs, a lot of clubs that are still serving food and playing golf. But in most cases, the people that are not golfers that see you out playing golf and a cart on a on the side of the, they're driving down the highway and they see people out playing golf, they're pissed, and they're calling their local legislator saying, "I'm stuck at home and look at these people out playing golf." Um, so you know, I had a course shut down over the weekend in Orange County just because they got tired of being harassed by the local residents that couldn't play golf because they weren't members of the club. I mean, it goes both ways. So urge your clubs to, no matter what they think they've heard from the insurance people, um, the broker, what the club's plans are, make them aware that uh, they need to file a claim, whether it's paid or not, we've got it on record that we, we at least are trying to recoup the lost income. And uh, you know that there's not much else good to this. Uh, it hit at a really terrible time while there's already a flu season going and uh, you know, golf, it's always been looked at as not a priority. But let me tell you, if you're in a private club and the guy's writing a check every month and he can't use his club, um, we need to be optimistic that, you know, it's not gonna last a long time and that we've, we've given them all the information of what we plan to do, what we're planning from keeping the club clean during the virus and what we plan to do when it's over. So uh, small business associations and all, all for you daily fee kind of players, they're gonna, operators, I mean, they're gonna take into account, did we keep our employees? And that'll determine whether you have to pay the loans back or not. I mean, it's it's crazy, but we're in a position that um, golf's not on anybody's priority list and, and we don't want to pay the price longer than we have to. So don't listen to the news. Talk to people that are actually proactive and, and uh, feel free to call me if there's any questions on what other clubs are doing that you might feel you're getting better information, you're free to call me. But in uh, in retrospect, um, 
we'll get through it. And the insurance, the insurance industry is running for the hills to, to not have to pay for anything because most of them have, you know, been cooped up at home too, but they can't change anything quick enough. That's the problem. So if you have any questions, I don't know if John's received any questions, but uh, that's sort of quick and to the point for those that know me. Um, it was a challenge for me just to learn what buttons to hit to move the, the pages on the presentation. So hopefully it was informative. And, and like I said, you're free to call me. Uh, the section has my information. Anything you need that would help through this time, uh, I'm definitely here in, in the future challenges with insurance. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, See you guys again. Yeah, we have a few questions that have come in. Uh, one from Tom Addis um, asking the question, uh, wouldn't a pandemic qualify as an actual event? The a pandemic, because it has that beautiful word virus in it, uh, gives the the insurance company, you know, it's not a tangible event. It's more of a virus or, you know, some infective, infectious kind of qualification. So, you know, there could be some, if you had a ton of money to, challenge the exact wording from the insurance companies, but they're using a form that's used for every policy that that they generate from. And um, for this industry and property coverage, uh, it is not considered a peril. It's not a considered, I don't think they've ever seen anything like this. So, until they want to include a limited amount of coverage for this, which I think that's all they would ever do, uh, it would it looks this isn't helping. We needed this to be a little less traumatic uh, to get the insurance companies to want to move quickly. I can tell you that, and nobody's in a hurry to hand out free money in their eyes when they've had an exclusion for all this time. Hope that I am. I don't want Tom, that critiquing could be very painful coming from Tom. So I hope that answers that. In terms of uh, those of us that work for a large corporation, uh, what advice do you have for us uh, in terms of, um, you know, of us being uh, unemployed during this time? Well, I mean, on, on the personal side, um, you know, what I've heard from other, you know, Troons and OB Sports and American Golf and Arnold Palmer is that, you know, this is a temporary situation. Um, I hate counting, thinking that we have to count on the government for anything, but I don't think anybody was prepared. So what you can do versus, you know, obviously unemployment if you've been laid off, but I would, this is going to trigger how you've been treated through this time. So there's going to be a lot of really good employees that are going to leave their current employment because of how they've been treated. I mean, I, I hope we don't all overreact, but I would just review how they're handling it. And, you know, I wish there was some secondary way to make additional money or options to move, but I would look I would look for how this has been treated and and what the management how they've handled the priorities when it comes to really good employees because 
this would be a time I wouldn't want to lose a key employee. And if I'm just doing mass layoffs, um, I'd be looking for a more stable company that could hand, you know, that moves through things like this with a little bit more care and keeping my best people on board. And look for every option to take advantage of what's being offered out there is the only other su suggestion. I don't, like I said, I don't think golf is being focused on as an industry that falls into, you know, uh, the restaurant category or whatever that I think it's going to be overlooked until we, we make us think about it or at least file for the same things the regular public is filing for because we're always going to be viewed as non-essential. You know, we're more of a luxury. I guess the, the curiosity is in why was there not more consideration uh, for the fact that, you know, rules can be customized to preserve social distancing um, and, you know, not touching the flag sticks, not touching the rakes and the bunkers and, uh, you know, everyone keeping at least six feet away from each other. Why wasn't there more consideration for the recreational uh, fresh air and exercise aspect as opposed to just a hard line across the board, close every golf course because, um, you know, we don't want the people getting inside so uh, inside six feet or interacting with each other or riding cars together. Why was there not more consideration uh, for the uh, for the exercise factor of it, considering it's all outdoors? Yeah, well, so the progression is in, in week one, uh, we saw all tournaments canceled. Then by the end of that week, we saw no guests play. Then the following week, it was nobody riding two in a cart. Everybody had to, you know, nobody has enough carts to have everybody have their own cart. Then don't touch the flagstick, cover your ball washers, take out food. So, I mean, I think we've done. So, for the last two weeks, I've been being sent uh, city orders county orders, LA County, Orange County, San Diego County. And uh, every time they update one of those orders, if it doesn't say golf, then we're the smartest people in the room. And we don't, if they don't identify golf specifically, all the Palm Springs courses should be playing golf with the same controls you put out there. Um, so I agree with you 100%, but only in the San Francisco area have I seen them take a, you know, hard line on all recreation. I mean, they close the parks. I mean, who, you want us to be outside, but you're going to close the park. So I, I would recommend whatever your city or county ordinance is to, if it doesn't say golf in that thing, in that, you know, memo or directive, uh, I would do all the things you just mentioned, keep your people as safe as possible. One of my first things I, I did with all my courses, I said, get a sandwich board, list the three or four symptoms, and at the bottom say, if you're sick, go home. If you're experiencing any of these things or you're sick, go home. Because the only protection we really could do for our clubs is to stop them before they touch a door handle, stop them before they drive a cart. Well, now we're to the other side of that where we've blown this thing out of proportion to the point of, you know, courses only have people walking. But I can promise you that 80% of the courses are still 
allowing people, they, they move their range stations six feet apart. They don't allow anybody to congregate. They took away all their picnic tables and outdoor seating. And people are bringing their own food like we used to do in the old days when you were a junior golfer. You bring your lunch, put it in your bag, and go play. Uh, I would encourage that unless it says something in your county order that golf specifically is to be shut down. And I, I don't think anybody, you know, it's sort of that ask for forgiveness later. But after three or four weeks of this, I think we got it figured out that, you know, if you don't touch anything, I saw people playing golf with rubber gloves. I mean, what it could kill the leather golf glove industry if they figure out they got a better grip with latex gloves than they do with golf gloves. I mean, that that's. I think it's a it's standing your ground a little bit to the point of you can't shut us completely down. I mean, I don't know if that's life according to Greg Twiggs, but. Clubs are doing it, and Palm Springs especially uh, shut their clubhouse down, but people are still playing golf. So, and people are bitching, you know, that nobody's happy about it. So, hopefully we can keep the negatives at bay and and uh, get through this quicker than maybe another industry might, like the restaurant industry. Next question coming in. Uh, the SCPGA has an updated list of courses and clubs that are open and closed. Most counties have restricted golf playing, but not maintenance in California. Right. Very so. inconsistent. Can go to the store. Oh, actually, it's not even a question. It's just a statement. That's all right. But, yeah, so, okay, forgive me. Uh, I guess the, the the million dollar question: How long do you see this going on for, without a cure uh, vaccine uh, created? Assuming that's not going to happen, how long do you see this going on for? Well, I you know the I think Easter um, is for sure. I don't. I think you know. The White House coming out and wishing for Easter, but it's really going to come down to, um, you know, how pissed we get as members of society being told to be cooped up at home. I mean, just so you know, COVID is the pre is the acronym for the flu. I mean, did we have to shut down everything? I can understand airlines. I had to stop traveling. I travel a lot. Um, you know, I was wearing a mask in February on the airlines. Um, but we're still, these are flu symptoms. We're going to shut down, I think, our members and our and the people are going to be well prepared to be social distancing and everything else and want to get back to work and want to get back to their regular lives. I don't know if, I hope it doesn't go any further than that because, you know, we're not all going to be on ventilators. I feel sorry for the people that do, but we lost 30,000 people to the flu last year. So I really don't know why this has become this way, but my my anticipation is I'm hopeful for Easter. I think the Monday after Easter, everybody's going to go, I didn't get sick. I know people that recovered. I'm willing to take the chance. I got to get back to work. And, you know, that'll be it. I hope. <laughs> I, can only, I can only hope, but, you know, government's involved now. Uh, hopefully it doesn't prolong it.
Okay, it looks like uh, it looks like those are all the questions that we have uh, for this morning. Uh, last call for questions. In the interim, I want to uh, thank Greg for his time and expertise this morning. Um, by far, uh, probably the weirdest catalyst uh, I've done in the last uh, uh, three and a half, four years. Um, just our, our scenario out here at Monterey Country Club, we are shut down completely. Every single employee, except for the superintendent, has been laid off. Um, however, I'm out here today to do the catalyst and to, to button some other things up, but uh, it's just kind of eerie to say the least. For those, uh, those of us that are on the call this morning, as usual, the catalyst quiz link will be going out shortly along with the YouTube recording of Greg's presentation. Please feel free to review to the YouTube recording to complete the quiz. Once you've completed the quiz, go ahead and submit it for grading. If you get a 70% or higher on the quiz, you will earn one MSR credit for attending this morning's Catalyst. Stand by here, I want to announce uh, our next Catalyst is going to be on April 9th with uh, Craig Kessler, Director of Governmental Affairs for the SCGA, and he will be talking about, uh, no doubt, the coronavirus and how it's affecting uh, legislature in California as it pertains to the golf industry. That will be a very good catalyst. Um, and Greg, thank you very much for your time and efforts today. We appreciate you being on the catalyst. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody. Be safe. And uh, we'll talk to you on April 9th. Have a great day. Bye-bye.